Welcome to Feminist Question Time, brought to you by Women's Declaration International, which is the leading global organisation defending women's sex-based rights against the threats posed by gender identity ideology. There's more information on our website, womensdeclaration.com, where you'll find our Declaration on Women's Sex-Based Rights, which has been signed by 37,089 people from 160 countries and is supported by 517 organisations. We have volunteer activists, including country contacts from all over the world, engaged in defending women's rights. Do join us. Uh, you can also become a member of WDI to help our work by donating or volunteering. Today, we are going to hear from Jenny Wilmot from Scottish Lesbians, and she's from uh, Scotland. She's going to be reporting on findings of a lesbian coming out study. Then we're going to have Jacqueline Joseph from Taiwan, who will report on the encroachment of gender, ident gender ideology in Taiwan. And we're going to hear from Rachel Cashman from the UK, from the classroom to the clinic, experiences of gender ideology. And then we're going to hear from Shannon from Here She, Here She, about an up to date, uh, updates on a campaign that she's working on. And I think the Amy Han uh, trial uh, information about that. We're going to have our first speaker, who is Jenny Wilmot from Scottish Lesbians. Uh, Jenny co-founded Scottish Lesbians with her partner, Lorraine Douglas, in 2022 as a grassroots Camp group campaigning for lesbian rights and well-being and thank you so much Jenny so over to you. So yes thank you I'm here as one of the co-founders of Scottish Lesbians we've been going about 18 months um, and it's a grassroots group for lesbians with a focus on campaigning for lesbian rights so for example we met um, members of the Scottish Parliament to discuss issues especially in the run-up to the Gender Recognition Reform Bill um, at the end of last year. We've written to MPs and MSPs. We've attended demonstrations and protests. Um, and we have a couple of online spaces where women, uh, lesbians, can interact um, safely. So we we gatekeep those spaces extremely carefully. Um, we We are aware of the risk of of men wanting to join them. Um, lesbian groups are a particularly um, popular source of validation for, for trans identifying men. Um, and we're aware of groups where infiltration has happened. So that's something that we do our very best to guard against. Um, but I'm today I want to talk about the research that we did um, last year and we've done the report, which is now out and available um, on our website. So we we undertook this research to provide data in an area where data is really lacking. Um, and I think for the lesbians in, in the audience now, a lot of what I'm going to say won't be new. Um, but what is new is doing it as formal lesbian focused research as far as we're aware um an awful lot of lesbian research published now either lumps lesbians in with lgbtq plus or it uses a definition of lesbian which we just don't recognize um you, you often see that written as lesbian with an asterisk um or researchers will use lesbian as a an umbrella term, um, an inclusive term, which is something that we we just don't agree with. Um, and and that's something that's been going on for a lot of years. Um, and for us, lesbians are exclusively same sex attracted women and any other definition is wrong, basically. Um, we are going to attempt to get the report published. And like I said, it's available on our website, which is scottishlesbians.org.uk. Um, and we did our recruiting for the study online, mostly via social media, mostly Twitter um, and via word of mouth. Um, and we made the study available to lesbians who came out at any time and in any country. And our inclusion criteria made it very clear that the study was only open 
to exclusively same sex attracted women. Um, and we we used a Google form to collect the data um, that included some consent and basic demographic questions, followed by six open questions designed to explore lesbians experiences of coming out um, that included things that were challenging, things that made it easier and their experiences of lesbian community. And it was a, an exploratory study. So we didn't want to push or encourage women in any particular direction with their answers. And we had, we actually had 73 submissions in total of which 72 met the criteria of being from exclusively same sex attracted women. The, the other submission was from a woman who, who just didn't meet the criteria. She reported being attracted to men and she answered using TRA slogans and statements about TERFs. The age range of the participants was 18 to 81. 30 participants were under 40 and 10 were aged between 18 and 25. And we were really, really pleased to have reached so many younger women. 60% of the respondents came from non-UK countries, um, 13 different countries. Um, so 40% of respondents were from the UK. And I, I want to make the point here that the study isn't global. Um, we, we achieved pretty good reach. Um, but it can't be described as global. Only one response came from a woman in a country where homosexuality is illegal. So the vast majority of respondents were women in countries where it's legal to be a lesbian and there's good access to the internet. And the study generated a lot of data, um, a really very rich and complex data set, which we analysed using thematic analysis and we identified four main themes um, and then considered what these could mean for lesbians using self-efficacy as a as a framework. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about self-efficacy theory today. There, there's a discussion section in the report which goes into what it's about. Um, I really want to focus today on the themes that we identified. So the four themes that came out of this were naming ourselves and being heard, role models, representation and making connections, porn culture, fetishization and the male gaze and gender ideology. And as I said before, I'm, I'm guessing that women here aren't necessarily going to be surprised by, by those themes, but we hope that that's because the study is a a true reflection of the pressures on lesbians at the moment. And there is considerable crossover between the themes, which we highlight in the report and I'll, I'll mention as we go along. The, the first theme, naming ourselves and being heard. Um, so that bit at the top in, in the, the purple box there is a direct quote from one of the participants. Um, and it reflects just how daunting and challenging some women find the word lesbian. And respondents gave several reasons for having difficulty with lesbian as a word, including its use as a slur, along with other words like dyke, um, the negative effects of Section 28 in the UK, and in one of the very obvious crossovers, um, porn culture and, and gender ideology. And central to naming ourselves as lesbians is the sexual boundary implied in that word lesbian. Lesbians are exclusively same-sex attracted women. We completely exclude men. And some respondents reported that initially they defined themselves as bisexual or in some other way, left open the possibility that they might consider men as partners. Um, and in some cases, they did this to kind of protect their families from, from having a lesbian in the family. 
And closely linked to this is the concept that some respondents described of lesbianism being seen as a phase or something that's open to change. Something that you could maybe summarise as you just need to meet the right man. And while that is obviously a difficult reaction to get from a loved one, some respondents reported outright abuse, including being threatened with being ostracised from the family, um, threats of violence or actual physical violence, being forced to watch pornography and rape. And they, the women described in very moving terms the, the catastrophic results that this had, including forcing themselves into heterosexual relationships. And thankfully, that wasn't a universal um, experience for women. Other respondents described it, receiving acceptance and reassurance from family members. Role models, representation and connections. We, we asked respondents to tell us about things which made coming out either to themselves or to others easier or more difficult and about their experiences of lesbian community. And a lot of respondents mentioned role models and representation. And for some women, seeing positive representations of lesbians was key to realizing that they were in fact lesbians themselves. For others, positive representation helped to, to counter social hostility. So one respondent, for example, remembered the absolutely horrible stories in the, in the British media during the, the height of the AIDS crisis in the 1980s and how reading lesbian literature and seeing those positive representations really helped her. Knowing lesbians in person was also felt to be helpful. Um, and the, the lack of real life lesbian role models made media representations even more important. For lesbians growing up more recently, online resources were helpful. So one lesbian um, in a country where homosexuality is illegal found YouTube videos helpful and has actually been able to come out to a mum. But of course, representation is not always either positive or helpful. Um, one respondent was concerned about the number of lesbian characters on the television who end up sleeping with a man, um, reinforcing the belief that lesbianism is a phase, something that can be fixed if you meet the right man. Um, and lesbian spaces were mentioned by many respondents as being hugely important, um, but they were described in nostalgic terms as things that that no longer exist. That includes the, the lesbian spaces, the lesbian only activist groups, the cultural groups. And some of the young women were aware of what used to be out there, what used to exist, and were really sorry. They really lamented the loss of those, those spaces and groups. And one or two respondents mentioned problems with lesbian community. And, for example, the focus on bars and alcohol, um, or with interpersonal or group dynamics women are human um but on the whole women felt that having that representation that visibility that connection to other lesbians was very positive and the lack of of those things could leave women very isolated and unhappy porn porn culture fetishization and the male gaze um i mean i the Nordic Model Now conference that's that's also on today has highlighted so many of the issues um, that pornography causes for women, including lesbians. Um, lesbian is the most searched for porn category in many countries, including Scotland. Um, 
and this theme is almost the the kind of the other side of the coin to the the previous theme so on the one hand you've got a a lack of real life positive role models for lesbians and on the other you've got a vast amount of pornographic distortion and misrepresentation all of it produced for the heterosexual male gaze and several respondents linked pornography to difficulties for lesbians when coming out um some again linked it to difficulties with the actual word lesbian um because it's linked with the sexualization of women and the centering of men um and others linked it to young women in particular opting out of being a lesbian altogether and choosing another identity and that's something that that I'll come on to in the next theme. Um, and part of this theme is the is the concept of the cotton ceiling, which I'm sure most of you are aware of. Um, but if there's anyone who, who hasn't come across the cotton ceiling, the cotton refers to women's underwear. Um, so the cotton ceiling is the the barrier to heterosexual men having sexual relationships with lesbians. Um, Angela Wilde was the first person to research the cotton ceiling and um, yeah, her work has been really, really helpful in bringing this out. Um, there is a, a male version of it as well, the boxer ceiling. And we've included the cotton ceiling in this theme um, because it's part of the repackaging of lesbianism for male interests. Again, on the one hand, you've got the production of pornography by and for men. And on the other hand, you've got the redefinition of lesbianism itself to include men. It's all about the men. And the lesbians who responded to our study are feeling pressured both to accept men in their groups and to accept them as romantic partners. Um, some of this pressure actually comes from other lesbians who are willing to, to include men in their spaces um, and are quite willing for, for other women to, to include them as other lesbians, to include them as partners. Um, and some respondents painted very disturbing pictures of the behavior of some of these men who have been admitted to lesbian spaces um, and to services such as dating apps. And it, it's another reason why we're very, very careful about gatekeeping with our groups. Um, and there was a strong feeling amongst respondents that lesbianism has been taken from us and presented to men, both by those who watch and produce and watch pornography and those who want to be seen and treated as women and as lesbians this this is a quality qualitative study so we, we're not looking to make any statistical claims um, from our data but the vast majority of the respondents raised gender ideology as something which is having a negative effect on lesbians and this wasn't unexpected only two respondents mentioned gender ideology in a neutral or positive way. And I, another point with this is that discussions of gender and, and self-ID are often focused on safety. And safety is, of course, really important. But our data shows that lesbians need spaces and representation for their own sake. It's not just about safety. The impacts of not having spaces, not having representation can be really dramatic. And gender ideology, really, the impact reflects all the themes I've spoken about so far and, and permeates everything. Um, when young lesbians name themselves now, they may avoid the use of lesbian, choosing instead something that that doesn't really tell you anything. For example, queer or sapphic non-binary, terms which don't indicate what's going on for that young person at all or even what sex they are. 
And parallel to this, there's been a shift towards the adoption of the term lesbian by people who are not and can never be lesbians, especially men. And as I mentioned earlier, the term lesbian sets out our sexual boundaries. If the meaning of the word lesbian is shifted to include non-women, what does that mean for our boundaries? As one respondent said, if lesbian now includes men, lesbians might find it easier to come out as something else. It was really sad actually reading some of these responses. Um, and another respondent pointed out that any move away from coming out as lesbians is likely to be embraced by those who would prefer us, even if it's only superficially, to be straight. And gender ideology was raised again as causing problems with representation, which meant that lesbians struggled to see themselves. One woman said the redefinition of lesbian to include men made her feel like a freak for only being attracted to women. Again, really very, very sad. Um, and many respondents mentioned the impact on uh, of gender ideology on lesbians' ability to meet, socialise and organise together. Um, the, I'm sure you're all aware that the Australian Human Rights Commission has now ruled that the Lesbian Action Group in Australia um, cannot legally exclude men from meetings aimed at lesbians, although they have now, I think, decided to appeal that decision. Um, and lesbians reported that spaces using the word lesbian in, a, in an inclusive way or as an umbrella term made them feel unwelcome or even unsafe. It, it led to lesbians self-excluding from those kind of spaces. And, and a lot of women mentioned the harm being caused by the splits that this is causing in lesbian community, um, leading to lesbians who don't wish to include men in lesbian groups being ostracized or, again, self-excluding because they, they don't want to be bigots. And there was considerable overlap between this theme and, and the previous one about porn culture and the male gaze. We, we've we used extensive quotes from respondents in the study. And many of the quotes could have been placed in, in either theme three or theme four. Women often mention pornography and gender self-ID and fetishization in the same statement. And as men become emboldened and, and in some cases encouraged to fetishize lesbians, enter lesbian spaces and identify as lesbians, it's increasingly challenging for lesbians to define ourselves and our boundaries. And two groups were highlighted by participants as being particularly vulnerable to gender ideology, young lesbians and butch or androgynous lesbians. And respondents often painted a pretty bleak picture for young lesbians. They're transphobic for, if they don't accept men as partners, and they've got role models who present themselves as trans men rather than lesbian, and they've got no lesbian community to turn to. And again, the, the impact on butch lesbians um, this often reflected the pressure that they would have felt to transition rather than come out as lesbians. And they use quite stark language about butch lesbians um, becoming extinct, decimated, uh, disappeared. The, as I said, the, the, the data set was very complex, very big and very complex. Um, these issues were also raised by by respondents um they weren't as dominant in the data as the as the four themes that we picked out but all of them would be worthy of further exploration on their own
as I said, we, we were really fortunate to get some young lesbians um, aged 18 to 25. And this is some of what they said. I think um, they they are they are feeling the pressure. Um, and since we did the study, we we've met more young lesbians and certainly they are getting organized. They're getting angry. They are. They are as much as they can organizing themselves um, and, and trying to to build communities. But of course, it's extremely difficult if they want to exclude men. Um, so the in conclusion, um, les it's important to point out that coming out, as every lesbian here will know, it, it's not a one off event. You don't just come out and that's it. It's an ongoing process throughout life. You might not do it every week, but you're certainly going to do it more than once. Um, and you're going to be making decisions about coming out on a reasonably regular basis. And so all of the themes that I've spoken about so far are going to have an impact each time you do that. Um, and lesbians' ability and confidence to come out is impacted by multiple factors. And for many lesbians, it, it remains difficult. You might think that there's been an increase in acceptance of homosexuality. Um, but we do need role models. We need representation. We need spaces. And we need all of those things to be for actual lesbians. And gender ideology has an intensifying effect on all the existing issues that lesbians face. Um, it causes unique and at the moment very present difficulties for lesbians in and of itself, but it intensifies everything else. And self-ID, I, I, I know there are women here um, from lots of different countries, um, but just speaking for Scotland, um, although self-ID, it was passed by the Scottish Parliament and then the, the UK government um, said no, basically. So we don't have legally self-ID in Scotland but we have self we have de facto self id and i think that's the case in in a lot of countries um the practices and policies and you know changing rooms and all the rest of it um have moved ahead of the law in scotland as i'm sure they have in in other countries um and that's a huge issue um and as we said in the last bit, the, the pressure to include and centre males is central to, to absolutely everything that I've spoken about today. Um, if you could put up the next slide, please, that's got a, a few voices of resilience and hope because some women did want, we, we gave women the opportunity to, to kind of say anything else that they wanted to add. And a lot of women did take that opportunity to to give us messages, basically, which was really nice. Um, and these were some of the voices of, of resilience and hope that came out of it. Like I say, you can download a copy of the report from our website. The report's on our website, which is scottishlesbians.org.uk. You can also email us um, or you can send us a Twitter DM, whichever is easiest. So we're now going to go to our second speaker, who is um, Jacqueline 
uh, Joseph from Taiwan. She's originally from Hawaii, USA, now based in Taiwan. She's currently pursuing a PhD in philosophy while working in Taiwan as a university lecturer. In addition to academic work, Jacqueline works as a journalist and published writer across various platforms and is an activist working in the field of women's rights and gynocritical research. She's co-founder and chair member of the NGO Taiwan Women's Association. She also wrote a chapter on this topic, which is the encroachment of gender ideology in Taiwan in the WDI book, Women's Rights, Gender Wrongs. And uh, thank you so much for coming on again. You've been on um, WDI Feminist Question Time and you're the contact for Taiwan. Um, so Jacqueline, um, over to you. And thank you. I am a permanent resident of Taiwan, not a citizen, but I've been here for 15 years. Um, so I've been here for a very long time. And I have previously um, come on and given a much more detailed uh, explanation of what we've been fighting against for the past three years with our organizations in Taiwan against gender uh, identity ideology here. Um, today, I decided not to use my slides because I didn't want to be too repetitive, but I decided to do a brief overview of what's been happening and kind of where we're at now. Um, so basically, and I'm kind of shocked, I'm looking back at my notes and realizing that our organizations here in Taiwan, um, we've been fighting this fight now for almost exactly three years. Um, and what happened three years ago was on September September 23rd here in Taiwan, it was the first case of a uh, the Taipei High Administrative Court here issued a ruling allowing a trans-identified male to change his legal sex marker to female without any sort of sex reassignment surgery, which was the first of its kind prior to that in Taiwan for uh, 20 years, you had to go through quite a few uh, coops. You had to go through quite a lot of uh, uh, process and procedure to change your legal sex. You had to go through surgeries. You had to go through several years of living as the opposite sex. Um, psychiatric evaluations. Very, very few people did it. It was not common at all. And in September of 2020, the first uh, legal woman with a penis, which we say in our organization, um, occurred in Taiwan. And that's how our organizations started. That's how I became allied with all of the amazing Taiwanese people here that I work with. Uh, you may be wondering where those Taiwanese people are. Unfortunately, due to the threats and the harassment and the cancellations uh, that they face, most of the people that I work with in the organizations um, here in Taiwan remain completely anonymous. Um, I'm one of two people who are sort of a public face um, but it's not safe for my colleagues to, to present themselves, their names, their faces. So most of them are, are anonymous. So this happened in the fall of 2020. This was something that got our attention and we started to organize around, around this fact because it sort of came out of nowhere in Taiwan. Um, this this self ID and the executive yen, which is Taiwan's highest administrative legal branch, uh, funded research on public opinion regarding self ID, and, but <laughs> they did it in a very sneaky and underhanded way. They spent about thirty seven thousand U S dollars, which here that's about one point three million Taiwan dollars. That's quite a bit of money. They gave the money to lead the study to see how public opinion felt about, about self-declaration of, of identity and being able to self-declare your sex and being able to change your, your legal ID. They gave that to a gender studies department at a local Taiwanese university, which of course was incredibly biased. Uh, the project was called Legalization of Gender Change Requirements and Le Legislative Suggestions. Um, but <laughs> the uh, research was compiled through a series of questions conducted online. And according to people that I work with within the 
uh, Taiwanese community who work with the government, the research was completely inaccessible to anyone actually within the public. The, the institutions who had access to it really only linked the form to transgender or LGBTQ related forums. And by LGBTQ, I mean the TQ, just the TQ part, uh, related forums and organizations. So they paid 37,000 US dollars for a, a government funded public opinion survey, which they then only sent to, to transgender and queer organizations. So it was heavily biased. And it only, it really only sought to get responses from a few groups. So when we found this out, we <laughs> quickly, uh, we quickly decided to act. And this was how our organizations in Taiwan formed. We formed two organizations based around our pure rage when we heard about this. Uh, so we started to organize. And what we did first was we started to organize an online campaign. Um, I'm not sure how how tuned into social media and apps the rest of the world is, but East Asia very much is so. Um, people communicate um, through through messaging apps and online platforms um, primarily and very technologically uh, friendly. So women, Taiwanese women around the city of Taipei and New Taipei began a campaign using messaging apps, online platforms to share this information about this this public opinion survey and about self ID because not a lot of people knew about it and about what it meant um, and we started a pamphlet and a flyer campaign so we were going around we had volunteers going around by hand passing out thousands of flyers putting them leafleting putting them in people's mailboxes handing them out to people in the street talking to people having people talking to their friends family members of the community to contact their local legislators to complain about the verdict. Uh, we started an organization called No Self ID Taiwan, which I'll link into the chat um, when I'm done with my talk. We have a website that's in Chinese in Taiwan. Um, we speak Mandarin Chinese as well as English, where we track the, uh, the growth, the progress of gender ideology here. Uh, we started No Self ID Taiwan and we started the Taiwan Women's Association, which is a now government recognized uh, nonprofit organization. It took us a year to get that done, but we did that. And we started last year in 2022, we started two pla uh, petitions opposing gender self-identification on Taiwan's public policy participation platform, each of which separately got over 5,000 signatures. The first demanded a halt to the alteration of sex markers and ID cards. And the other was a demanded a clear separation of the safety of women and children, uh, the protection of women-only spaces and female safety being at the forefront of our, of our work in our organizations. Um, so with the passing of those uh, petitions, the government is required by law, because we got so many signatures, to publicly address um, our demands, our questions which will occur soon. Um, they, they are aware that we have enough people on our side to make things difficult for them. And um, another thing that is happening in Taiwan is that um, Taiwan will soon allow trans-identified people to participate in the National Secondary School Games, which is the largest uh, athletic games in the nation the, in this year in cross category categories, cross sex categories. Um, so it only recently came to light. We only just found out that a trans identified male competed as a woman in the Taiwan National Intercollegiate Athletic Games in 2018. Um, and he completely blew the uh, previous record out of the water by a woman. And the problem, the big, big problem that we're facing right now is that they haven't clearly defined the laws for what this means. Um, what happens in Taiwan is that often they go with public policy that they see popularized in the West and they just kind of push it through without clarifying any sort of laws or rules in place. So what we have is 
is them saying that in these national secondary school athletic games um, and intercollegiate games, we will allow anybody to identify however they want and compete in whatever category they want. They feel female, they can compete as female. They don't, they haven't actually provided the public with rules, regulations, and what that means. And the public is not happy about it. Coaches, the 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 uh, organization for coaches in Taiwan have said you should wait a couple of years and provide us with guidelines. Uh, parents are are not pleased about it. No one's happy about this, but they still push it through. So we're not sure what this is going to mean because um, because the these games are the the way that Taiwan chooses athletes for participation in the Olympics. So this very much opens the door to athletes who participate in these games could very well then become athletes that we see participating, representing Taiwan, who unfortunately, because of issues related to China, is called Chinese Taipei in the Olympics. But that could very much affect who we see participating in the Olympics. So that's happening this year. And that's something that we're paying attention to. Um, another thing that is happening is that um and and this this is related this is and I'll, I'll i'll relate the two issues um it was announced this week that commercial surrogacy which has been completely banned in taiwan commercial surrogacy is going to be most probably legalized in taiwan uh legislature is looking to overturn um the the ban on commercial surrogacy um, Taiwan is following the money in, in this particular situation. Taiwan was the first country in Asia to legalize um, same-sex marriage in 20, uh, 2019. And there was a rush of uh, uh, organizations and agencies who promote themselves as LGBT plus uh, agencies to help couples um find surrogates around the world. So mostly in the United States, they came to Taiwan and they would help place couples here um, with surrogates, uh, mainly from the United States. And hundreds of couples have participated in that with a cost of up to, a, it, it's staggering, it's mind blowing, but the cost of up to 140,000 US dollars um, to go through this procedure, which is almost 10 times the average um, annual salary in Taiwan, um, almost 10 times the average um, annual salary. So all of that money is being paid to outside agencies. And I think in Taiwan, um, again, following the queue from the West and seeing how much money is being made and also sort of the glamorization of surrogacy. Um, in Taiwan, we also, like Japan, have the declining birth rate, um, delayed age when people get married and have children, um, Taiwan is 100% going to embrace the commercial surrogacy route. Earlier this year, we had the absolutely disgusting organization, Men Having Babies. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this organization. It's a nonprofit from New York run by a, a repulsively misogynistic uh, gay man who goes all around the world helping men pay for children ripped out of women's bodies. He came to Taiwan um, a few months ago. He will be back in 2025 um, because he sees that's where the money is. And along with that, there's been a new organization started in Taiwan called um, the Taiwan Trans Medical Association, which is the first of its kind happening in Taiwan. It is a it is the first organization of, of medical professionals who are gathering together to profit and make money from surgeries and cosmetic surgeries to be done on trans identifying patients or anybody who wants to have those, those alterations. There are on the board, there are no, there are no experts in, in gender dysphoria or anyone who has an expert in, in, um, psychiatry. There's no, experts dealing with anybody with with backgrounds in with gender dysphoria or or anything like that it's it's purely 
an organization that is promoting itself as this um this this uh altruistic sort of organization that oh we want to help people who who have gender dysphoria it's it's purely a board of plastic surgeons who has popped up to to make a ton of money from what they they see coming with with self id so these are two things that are sort of looming on the horizon right now in taiwan that we're we're sort of keeping an eye on that are worrisome well i guess three actually sports um commercial surrogacy which was just announced this week which but we've kind of seen coming for a while and uh the the self id which hasn't really which hasn't really gone off yet but now with these medical organizations starting we we we're starting to see that coming um and yeah that that is uh that is what we are up against here in Taiwan, and that is what my allies, my my Taiwanese allies, and I are are keeping an eye on, fighting against, and and hoping to push back against as much as we can. So we're going to go now to our next speaker, who's Rachel Cashman. She's from the UK. She's a former National Women's Officer of the Labour Party and a current co-founder of PSHE Brighton, the community organisation for parents, teachers, governors and social workers concerned with the safeguarding for children in school. So you haven't put this in your bio, but it sounds like you've been in the belly of the beast. You are in the <laughs> belly of the beast and you've been in the belly of the beast. Yeah. Um, so right from the heart of um, the push pushing in classrooms, Thank you so much, Rachel. And um, your talk is From the Classroom to the Clinic, Experience of Gender Ideology. Over to you. Joe. thank you so much. And it's a real um, privilege, actually, to be um, online this afternoon with, you know, over 150 women from across the world. And I am based in a small town called Brighton in, by the seaside in England with a population of about 270,000. But um, we call Brighton the godfather of misogyny for a reason, because it is the town that has become the engine room for gender ideology, in particularly in relation to children, but in other areas uh, as well. And just to give you some of the context of what's happening in the city of Brighton before we talk about what's specifically happening in schools, um, we, we are a, a city that currently has not a single service as a single sex service for women who are the victims of rape or violence in the city. In fact, there's a seminal court case being taken uh, uh, that's due to be heard in the courts next year uh, because of um, all of the rape crisis centres in Brighton uh, have policies of self-identification and allow self uh, men who self-identify as women to attend uh, those organisations. Um, we are a city whereby uh, most recently a woman was sacked from her role in the cabinet of the local authority uh, simply for liking a tweet that referred to biological sex um, being um, immutable. Uh, and the rollout from that, as people would probably imagine on this call, was a, a whole series of protests and harassment about that particular individual. And what we have is a set of, of institutions in the city that are completely um, captured. And I come to this from a range of perspectives. I, you know, uh, Previously, I have been a chair of governors in the city in a, in a large primary school. And, um, and so I've been in and around the education sector of the city for quite some time. But in the last couple of years, what has happened is um, uh, the complete institutional capture of uh, gender identity, which some would say stems actually from the universities in the city where there's really strong teacher training. So the kind of initial capture around the university sector and how that has then transcended into the behaviour of activist teachers in schools. And I uh, founded with a, a group of people, uh, as you said, Joe, uh, we founded PSHE Brighton because we were there was starting to become a network of people across the city, social workers, school governors, teachers, parents, who are concerned about the range of impact around gender ide identity theory in schools, whether it was the teaching of materials or whether it was the material harm that was happening to children. 
And I just want to give you today kind of four stories, if you like, um, that, uh, that kind of epitomize what the range of things that are happening and the things that have been reported to us at PSHE Brighton. And PSHE stands for Personal Social Health uh, Economic Education. So the first uh, uh, kind of story is kind of potentially quite mild, but actually has been really profound for the individual concerned. And believe me, this young woman is not alone. So she goes to a very uh, prominent or went to a very prominent secondary school in the city. She is now 18, 19 years old. She has recently discovered um, a number of kind of feminist uh, uh, writing. And she is, this has kind of overwhelmed her because for the last few years, she has been questioning her, her sex, questioning her gender systematically as a consequence of a school institution that on a termly basis, so she tells us, would survey the pupils, asking them if they were questioning their gender, asking them if their discomfort about teenagehood was in relation to a discomfort with their body and a discomfort with their identity. So again, she was very, uh, uh, very much felt, as others of her, her peers have felt, that they were almost being kind of brainwashed into thinking there must be something wrong with them and therefore that thing must be about their gender identity and they must therefore identify as somebody, somebody that they are not. And I should say this particular individual, when she came to us, very little trauma in her life, you know, very little of the kind of characteristics we see, but it still had a profound effect Um what then happened, the next uh, uh, example that we've got is that we've got a number of uh, schools where we have uh, teachers who've been reported by peers as well as by parents and pupils who have um, given really um, overzealous punishment to children for misgendering staff. And in this particular instance, this was a group of 11 and 12 year olds in their first week to a brand new school who thought they were being polite by saying, yes, miss, to the teacher. And the teacher said, that is, I, re I am identified as a mix, not a miss. You are harassing me, you're misgendering me. And the children were then put in a kind of a, a, a lockdown detention. Um, and this happened two years in a row for the cohorts of children that joined the school initially. In the same school, we have also had uh, examples of a teacher who um, declared herself to the children as being non-binary and therefore neither male nor female, therefore was not required to use sanitary protection uh, because they didn't recognise that they were menstruating and therefore bled through um, their clothes. And, and, and what prompted there was a discussion with the children actually about this individual's kind of power and identity as opposed to biology and there was a huge a number of very um, upset parents and children as a result um, of that. Moving forward again to something as we get kind of more sinister as we go through the kind of four, uh, the four kind of case studies and vignettes that I'm kind of sharing. Um, the next uh, circumstance we'll talk about was a, a child again at a different school in the city, um, and this particular child was autistic, um, uh, had a, a diagnosis of autism had some family trauma in their past and is same-sex attracted. And uh, the, the child uh, went to school, had an assembly at school from a local trans-affirming charity who said, suggested the child might want to explore their identity. The child was then referred to that charity by the school for one-to-one -one counselling. And this is the child was 11 years old at this time. And during that one-to-one counselling session with a male psychotherapist though we have reason to believe the individual isn't actually a qualified psychotherapist um the child was directed online to purchase a penis packer so a fake penis to wear to see how they felt uh living life as a boy whilst they were exploring um their identity this by the way was all behind the backs of the uh, parents and then in the final example that i will give um uh, this uh, child, again, same-sex attracted, autistic, a history of trauma. Um, the same charity, but a different school in the city, the same charity um, began exploring uh, the, their identity, was referred uh, to the charity. And it's a particularly complex uh, story. But um, uh, in short, within the space of uh, 12 weeks, this particular child had gone from being socially transitioned by institution staff at both the school 
and social services behind the backs of the parents without the permission of parents. So name and pronouns were changed. And within 12 weeks, that child had received the prescription for, t- for testosterone from a local National Health Service general practitioner who was operating at the kind of boundaries, if you like, uh, of practice. Some would say completely unethical, but they were using, it's believed, a kind of a bridging prescription mechanism, which is meant in specialist circumstances around uh, uh, specialised uh, services. Um, but they were using it to prescribe uh, a child cross-sex hormones. Now, uh, these four stories I uh, shared quite recently at a conference, which is how I met Joe. And I think what's also interesting as a consequence of the local media coverage and the national media coverage in the English press, as a result of us sharing those stories, within three days, PSHE Brighton had 20 families contact our organisation with identical stories to the last two that I've just described. So there is certainly a swell of concern across what is actually quite a small city, you know, 250,000 population. Um, And what we're seeing is something that's pretty endemic and an institutional systemic capture uh, across our institutions. And we're starting to understand now that we've got a mass of families that are concerned, we're starting to understand the patterns that are occurring in the city and even in those families where they have reluctantly usually accepted the social transition of their child because they've been told or convinced usually by the local trans affirming charity that it is in the child's best interest or it will protect the child's mental health there's still three things that that are commonly found in the families we're talking to one is as I say, this institutional capture. So whether that is the local authority, whether that is children's social services, whether that is the state school system, um, there is absolutely no space for a divergence of views or a dialogue about what may be in the holistic interest of the child. There is an assumption that gender gender ideology and gender identity is the issue and therefore the child must be trans and the child is kind of fast-tracked through this pathway. The second thing is the role of the local trans affirming charity. So this is about where um, what we would describe as the outsourcing of quality assurance, outsourcing of curiosity, outsourcing of intellectual rigour in relation to the teaching around sex, biology, relationships, PSHE, education in schools has been completely outsourced to an ideological trans affirming charity. And the third thing that is coming across as a pattern is the kind of failure of head teachers to respond productively, to respond well to the issues when they're presented. And that can be from two angles. One that can be just a kind of a a refusal to engage in anything that is questioning gender ideology. The other angle is almost this kind of captivated staff room. So a staff room that is hijacked by trans activist teachers with head teachers having very little space for manoeuvre to actually lead in this area. Um, People might be aware that there are long-awaited guidance uh, in the UK to come out from our National Department for Education to give such guidance to schools. Um, However, what we would say is we don't need to wait for that guidance because we actually have existing legislation in terms of our safeguarding legislation, in terms of the Children's Act, in terms of the Education Act, that should be preventing the kind of material harms that we've just described and the behaviours that I've just described today, they should be preventing these things from happening. At PSHE Brighton, we're really clear in our position, which is that we think all of these examples constitute various degrees of safeguarding concern. And whilst these are live concerns for the population, be that social worker, whistleblowers, teachers, parents or school governors, whilst these concerns are live, we, um, we must keep highlighting them until such time as there is a proper statutory public inquiry into what is happening in our schools and social services across England. But in our view, uh, the best place to start with that inquiry would be in the city of Brighton, because for such a small population, it's completely institutionally captured. Um, And if we can uh, remedy things in Brighton, then there's a good chance you can remedy things across the rest of England. I'm very conscious of time, Joe, so I'll pause there. Um, and uh, and happy to take any questions uh, now or at a later date. Seems Hmm. to me that in schools, um, quite often when safeguarding comes up, 
that the answer is to channel the pupil to the well-being service or to the mm. school psychotherapist type person yeah. and that then becomes shrouded in secrecy mm. and nobody including often the parents don't find out about it and so that then becomes safeguarding they the the, the response is well we're doing safeguarding by not telling you about it by not telling anybody mm. about it's our little secret um what what we're up to mm. and that seems to be a massive i i agree with the argument that safeguarding is important but the moment you start using safeguarding it seems like that's a very double-edged sword because it's used because of the sanctity of that it's you know mm. that place that mm. um the professionals know best so how are you challenging that yeah it's a really good question joe and there's a couple of things on that the first is you know we would say we want a safeguarding first approach in schools but we would also say that that does not mean that we support um, the kind of um, weaponizing of the word safeguarding in the way that you've just described in terms of the behaviours that happen. So if we think about the school's um, uh, systems that exist, so we know, for example, that in the UK, there's a system called CPOMS, which is the school record keeping system. And it's used for when there are um uh, if there are concerns around children and safeguarding concerns would be part of, would be, should be recorded on the CPOM system. We have cases that have come to PSHE Brighton where um, activity that should clearly be recorded on a safeguarding system and then escalated through the school leadership team in the appropriate way, there's been a failure to record. So we've got examples of where there has been, whether it's about um, issues of, of self-harm issues of around access to cross-sex hormones or the, uh, the crime to access puberty blockers um, and that failure to record. So it's almost as if when it comes to the issues of gender identity and gender ideology, professions have forgotten what safeguarding means and they've created this new definition for, de definition for it, which is linked to secrecy and being doing things behind parents' back. And what we would say is we need to go back to the basics of safeguarding as is written in the Education Act and the Children's Act. And we need to be executing that properly with the appropriate quality assurance. And, and that presumably way, that could be done through the courts as well, that parents could complain. They could ask for their children's records and all the CPOMs because they can get, yeah. I guess, parents can get every single record. But if, yeah. if there's evidence that somebody's been giving a child 11 year old girl packers or suggesting that that should be um recorded and if it's not then that that's a that's not safeguarding yeah so we have examples within our community in brighton of uh uh families who have requisitioned records in from schools and information such as that that you've described isn't fully recorded on a system like cpons that has come to light through the exchange of emails that have been recorded through um, either subject access requests or other things. So it can be very difficult for families to truly find out what is going on in terms of the, the non-academic side of their child's education if there are those who are intent on withholding and keeping it secret from, from those families. And it should also be said that, you know, if teachers have concerns about families to the extent they wish to keep something secret, then they should be using the same safeguarding mechanisms to engage those families, report those families and do the requisite investigations. You know, safeguarding is there for, for a reason. One of the things I admitted to talk about before was the creation by our local authority of a trans toolkit. And in Brighton, that has been in existence since, since 2011, it is one of the original trans toolkits in England. And colleagues on the chat were talking about Oxford, and um, the toolkit in Brighton has been copied by a number of other local authorities across England. So they um, who are now adopting the same kind of ideology and mechanisms as promoted in the Brighton Trans Toolkit. And indeed, in Oxford Council, um, they were taken to court in relation to the Trans Toolkit and the council withdrew the toolkit before it got to court. Um, and so there are others, uh, there are, we're always looking for people to think about legal action in Brighton as well, because it was the original you know, producer of the toolkit. But for those outside of Oxford or Brighton, the organisation Safe Schools Alliance in England, who is one of the signatories to the declaration, gather materials, 
across the um across the whole country and are really solid on this stuff so if people have i would urge people to look at their website too as well as pshe brighton and thank you very much for having me today so we're going to now go to shannon from he or she he or she usa she's from the usa and she has is going to tell us about a holiday letter pamphlet campaign and also is it the amy han uh proceedings or what's happening there so thank you so much um shannon and over to you campaign that's safe anonymous easy from home actions it's global we can all participate i've tried to make it we know that time is precious for our sisters uh and um, I want to also say that it's a two a two year anniversary for here she here she but three years for our our annual campaign and thank you Joe and all of WDI who uh, I got here just in time <laughs> so thank you for that um, and to all our sisters who do participate in our actions um, who come here as well uh, it's been fantastic so always remember that every letter matters that time, uh, every bit we put in, if we do 40, if we have 100 women who do 40 letters each, even if it's just handing out, that reaches 4,000 new minds to open. So every action we can take matters. And it's nice, this is anonymous, it can't be traced back to you. Um, only I put my email on. Here she, here she only works by an email once a week. Everything's anonymous unless you choose you want a response, which is always great. So we've tried to put in five direct actions into this simple campaign. Um, one is uh, the first, what it's about is that Salvation Army is now allowing men fully in women's and children's shelters. So there is a BC Canada lawsuit uh, happening from a, a young woman who is, has experienced this um, as many have now. Um, so this is, we have two direct actions with the letter. So what we do is we make up a form letter that has all the information, a couple of horrific graphics, but including WDI's, well, some people think it's horrific, letting people know men are in women's shelters, WDI's declaration. So one of the direct actions is to ask your retailers or grocers to sign WDI's declaration, as well as other sisters that you share this with. And then we add your own personal note. This is the key. The key is a handwritten envelope that gets opened and then a personal note in color and children's art is always especially effective. So this is, is an effective program. I've used uh, their template to make it. So we have one letter that's going directly to your retailer, your grocer, the donors of Salvation Army. And then we're including one that's directly to the Salvation Army um, that they can send, hopefully stating they're not going to donate anymore, as well as the sisters can directly write and anyone you share it with to Salvation Army and to give it to the people who are doing what they call the kettlebell ringing, their Santas, because those volunteers, I'm quite sure, don't understand that men are in women's and children's shelters sharing a 25 bedroom, you know, with women. That's where we're at. And and uh, they make about $162 million a year they pull in from these uh, kettlebell ringers and the donors at the end of their year. Um, so we're trying to peak the people, vote with your dollars, um, uh, vote with your shopping, let them know you're voting with your shopping. So we can all do this. So it's here she, here she at gmail.com. You can see the chat. The kickoff is also at our American Thanksgiving game. Uh, so we're going to have a social media blast with hashtags and the supporters uh, during that time to really get on the platforms as well. So that's a big one. Um, so so we've tried to make a five part. Uh, I call it direct and redirect action where we're not only hitting them directly, directly we're also asking a redirect in there as well as supporting WDI and uh all the things we're trying to do for women and children. So, and we'll be in the breakout rooms to talk more. We can hang out, write letters together. Uh, WDI is such a beautiful space. Nina and I will be there. Um, we wish we could share cider and cookies as well, but WDI has such a beautiful breakout uh, room space for all of us that um, you're really missing out if you don't come in and hang out with, with the sisters. 
So it's basically save women's shelters. There's a lawsuit against Salvation Army. We need to peak the people that uh, dangerous men, not just any men. People need to say that with men, but uh, they're in the they're in the space, just like they're in the prison cells. So that's um, so we so it's not only peaking them, but also having an ask on there of what we want from them. Um, and we'll go over the instructions and hashtags, and it's really not complicated. You just sign your first name. Um, so that's the easy part. That's uh, we've made it as easy as possible. So just come in and join us. It also by uh, email we can send you the PDFs, share them, drop them, just like any pamphlet. But when you have your personal note on there, even if it's to a neighbor, dear neighbor, I'm concerned about, makes people read it uh, a lot more. And we all need a little more in touch with each other these days uh, to change minds. Um, and then uh, so that's break through PC. Um, Okay, so the, okay, so um, the Amy Ham trial, the, um, she is a nurse, she's in BC, Canada, and BC, Canada is, and I'm a Canadian in California, Canada is the first of common law, um, Commonwealth law, is the first country in all of Commonwealth law history to have compelled speech in law. They have made it illegal to use the wrong pronouns. She is fighting in a lawsuit, which they've put on live. So there is a there is also a, um, uh, Nina's hopefully got it in the chat, but you can go on and watch it live. So we've been doing that. Um, which is incredible, especially for Canada. Public records are not a, not really welcome in Canada. Um, so she is a nurse who has stood up for biology. Uh, she's worked with trans people. She's worked with indigenous people, um, uh, the most vulnerable. I mean, she's just amazing. You can follow her on at Preta, P-R-E-T-A-6. Give your support there. She, she doesn't have a gag order, so she is tweeting apparently. I don't do Twitter. Um, and it was incredible. Uh, Coach Blade, Dr. Blade, Dr. Stock, and a Dr. Cantor were all on to stand up for her. Uh, I don't know if it'll be put out later, but do, uh, one of the other across the aisle, basically the government, because we ha they have human rights tribunals before the Supreme. It doesn't become Supreme Court yet. It's with the government, which is the same but it's from the um, nurse association against her, really tried to push her to state. And they even said, it's law, you have to call them assigned female at birth. It's law, you have to da da da. And she just kept repeating herself and sticking with her facts as she has the right as a belief. Uh, but does, but um, so it was really incredible. She's just, this, she looks so calm and she's so put together. Uh, and we can just learn so much from how words matter and facts matter. Now, with the Salvation Army case, uh, they have actually taken on Denton's law firm. Denton, the big law firm about the gender stuff against uh, this young woman bringing the suit. And I actually said uh, to her that I believe this is actually a good sign. It means they're scared. They're bringing in the big guns to her case. But unfortunately, that's hard, harder, even harder for her. But the Salvation Army, they, I mean, even that they still call it a women's ministries. I'm just, they can't see it. So we need to peak their volunteers, uh, get, get it known out there, because it's one of the biggest charities and trusted names globally. Um, and they need to know this isn't, they had a lot of pressure from the trans pushers about 10 years ago. Um, and now they, you know, they need to know this, this isn't okay. And especially if you have any Christian affiliates um, who present this uh, need to know the harms for women and children. Um, so as far as Amy Ham, it starts up again in the new year. We don't know the exact date yet, but it will continue to be live um, where they're, she's been at this three years for love. And um, so they'll give more information there. Um, so just keep supporting her. 
and uh, support our letter campaign and come into the breakout rooms and be together and write letters and hang out. <laughs> Thank right. you, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>